Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the show. I'm Richard Contramundum, Richard Against the World, uh, and today I have a special guest doing a Q&A about end times, Gary DeMar. Uh, he is going to be with us in a few minutes. Uh, we're going to just look at a few things. Uh, he had a slight scheduling conflict, no big deal, uh, but he will be in with us uh, in a few moments, probably 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, something like that. Um, he is the president of American Vision. You can see that here on the screen. Uh, it is a ministry, worldview apologetics ministry out of Georgia. It's near Atlanta. It's not just end times, although he's talking specifically about end times today. And uh, it's about apologetics and just living a faithful Christian worldview. He is a prolific author and speaker, scholar. He's done a number of debates and quite a few other things that have just been really, really helpful uh, over the years. He's done very consistent ministry. Uh, he's got a great testimony. He was an athlete in high school and into college. Really, really good track and field athlete um, and actually helped disciple many guys in his youth and um, that kind of got him into a lot of ministry as well. He might talk a little bit about, although hopefully we'll have a number of questions um, along the way. So if you do have, I know we have a few people here already, uh, put a cue or question in front of your question so I can see it. And once he's with us, we'll, uh, he'll be directed uh, accordingly. Um, he does have a few different things online as well, uh, besides American Vision. Let's, we'll look at this a little bit though. Uh, more specifically here, he's got, like I said, a blog. Uh, he writes here regularly. He's got a number of different uh, books over the years. He's written a lot of things, most on post-millennialism and times, critiquing other views like premillennialism and, and that sort of thing. Premillennialism requires another Jewish holocaust. Wow, see right there. I mean, it pulls no punches. Uh, <laughs> you can see that. This came out just a couple days ago. He's debated uh, guys like Kent Hovind, Michael Brown, uh, many others as well, talking about differences of eschatology and the like. That really is his wheelhouse. He also re responds, or rather records these uh, in his blog cast, uh, kind of like you know Doug Wilson. He's familiar with uh, them uh, at Canon Press. Canon Press puts this on here and... Uh, yeah, he'll record this. I think he just does audio. It doesn't do video like Doug Wilson does. Uh, but nevertheless, he reads it like Doug Wilson does his blog and May blog. Those are just reading. Sometimes it's a little awkward because he says, as you read above, but he speaks it. <laughs> and it's a video. Uh, it's pretty funny. But very, very helpful uh, in similar vein with this as well. He also is uh, on... Oops, that's what I want. He's on um, iTunes. You can find him on iTunes, probably some of the other blog podcasts as well. He has an, a separate podcast. So he's got the Der Gary DeMar blogcast, where he's just reading his blogs that I just said here. that we just looked at this on American Vision. But then he's also got a regular podcast um, in that he shares a little bit more kind of open-ended and it's a longer format as well. So those are really, really helpful. Check those out. A few other things real quick uh, while we do, and you all get your questions lined up. He has been the president here a number of years. Um, this is his page here. Gary, who served as president of Vision, American Vision for 35 years, graduate of Western Michigan, earned an MDiv from Reformed Theological Seminary, um, and he's in, as you can tell, at the PCA there. He's written 35 book titles, so... For as long as he's been the president of the ministry, he's written uh, a book for each, which is quite impressive, quite impressive indeed. They've got a store, Last Day's Madness. Uh, it doesn't just sell. This isn't just a Gary DeMar only. Uh, I know some people kind of, that's their ministry. They start the ministry and that's all they do. They don't promote anybody else. It's kind of very... Um, inward focused and inclusive and whatnot. And that's fine. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that per se. Uh, but the church is broader than that. And a lot of times it's more helpful to have a little bit more, a bigger reach. And that's what they have here. Um, he's got, I've got this book, not read the whole, read the whole thing. Uh, this is Vindicii Contra Tirana. See, there it is, Contra. We get that. That's just Latin. Pretty fancy. I like it. That's why my name and my channel is the way it is. 
Kings must be obeyed for God's cause and not against God, and then when they serve and obey God and not otherwise, that sentence of God Almighty must always remain irrevocably true. So this is like a 500-year-old book. Julius Brunus, that was a pen name for the author. Uh, but he's also, they sell Greg Bonson against all opposition. Great apologist. He died in the 90s. He had some weird blood vein disorder. Uh, brilliant guy. He had his PhD by the time he was 30. Uh, very articulate. But you can find a lot of their things on Canon Press or even online. He's got a worldview class talking about all the stuff we're dealing with 25, 30 years later. And it's quite astounding how some of these guys are very uh, prescient in their views. I think, you know, there might be a level of propheticness there, not necessarily future casting, but understanding the times, which is where most Bible prophecy actually is, is understanding the times and proclaiming it accordingly. So here's a book by Theodore Roosevelt, right? He's not around anymore. Uh, Before Jerusalem Fell, this is sold out. Ken Gentry is another big name in the eschatology world. Namely, from a uh, end times, post-millennial view. Those who just joined us, by the way, Gary will be uh, with us probably in the next 10-15 minutes. There was a slight conflict with his schedule. So we're just kind of introducing everybody. Thanks, everybody. Hey, Seth and uh, uh, Grandma Joe and Jeff Wilburn. I don't recognize you, Jeff. Welcome. Uh, Simply a Berean. Uh, bottom line, Dad. Simply Berean. Is that Micah? Right? Is that who? Is that your name? So are you a post mill Baptist? Uh, I'm just a Christian. <laughs> I mean, I'm leaning that way, but I haven't fully vetted everything, to be completely honest. Uh, like many Christians in uh, America in the last 50 years, it's been heavily premillennial dispensational. So rapture, seven-year tribulation, and a lot of times you take that to its logical end, that means Israel is going to be saved, but saved in a different way, or they're already saved. And I know there's variations, and I don't want to get into it too much, uh, although this is a Q&A about end times. Um, that's where a lot of people are very pro-Israel, and I'm, I'm pro-Israel as much as the next guy uh, in the sense of more political. Uh, I'm thankful that they kind of have what they have and whatnot, but it's also not, I'm not like, got all my eggs in that basket. But a lot of people do. And I think it's been very detrimental to a lot of people, and that's my opinion, with looking for the rapture, looking for an escape hatch, and not really devoting generations. I, I know, uh, I think it's Doug Wilson's dad tells a story. During World War II, he had a friend. So his dad's like in his 90s. So World War II, 60, 70 years ago, right? And um, 80 years ago, I guess. And he ha- his father uh, had a friend, or knew of a guy, who didn't have children. Because they saw Hitler, saw him on the scene, knew he was the Antichrist, so-called, quote-unquote. And they didn't have kids. And, well, Hitler was an Antichrist. He was against Christ and opposite of Christ, but he wasn't the Antichrist. And the problem with that is they don't have children now. And they've completely destroyed their legacy. They're, they're probably long dead, and that's it. Now, I understand, you know, this side of eternity, okay. But we are called to be fruitful and multiply. We are called to shoot out arrows into the world. We are called to be faithful. Uh, parents, faithful husbands and wives, faithful churchgoers, faithful citizens, and so on. And ultimately, you know, knowing that this isn't our home and God is preparing a new heavens and a new earth, but we have, there's work to do here. And if you have, and you're looking under every rock for the Antichrist, for demons, for whatever, and a lot of uh, charismatics will do this too, you know, always, oh, I want to speak in tongues, I want this, I want that, and I need this, and I need a second blessing, and I need all these extra things, and you don't. Um, so, anyway, I think the premillennial dispensational view has really been um, detrimental overall uh, to to the American church in particular. Let's see. There's a couple of the good book. I mean, these are all several. I'm not. I've not read most of these, to be frank. Uh, Pillars, five pillars of biblical success. That's a great book. Gary North is another guy who's very, very uh, popular in the American Vision world. Doug Wilson, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's different streams, even within these guys, even within uh, Calvinism, non-Calvinism, Baptist, Presbyterian, um, and many other scholars, both present and even since Christ ascended. Uh, there's not ever not two guys uh, fit into the same category or fit exactly all everything in cookie cutter. Everybody's got a kind of slight different uh, view on certain things, and that's good. And we should also be willing to 
um, be renewed, right? Have our minds renewed. Blaming Moses. Rejection of Mosaic Law. This is really good, too. I've not read this book, but I've heard it. Yeah, Moses here, he's got horns. That was a mistranslation from uh, the Hebrew. <laughs> so this, I think that's Michelangelo who sculpted that statue, I think. Anyway, so he's got, they've got a number of books here, lots and lots of books. Uh, Last Day's Madness is probably one of the best ones, especially just for the topic proper. Uh, Judeo-Christian tradition, Jubilee to the Constitution. Here it is, Last Day's Madness. So very, very good book. Um, talks a lot about the obsession, right? We Eschatology is huge. And we want to know what's happening, and that's good. But we get so caught up in newspaper exegesis, as um, Gary DeMar calls it. And it's basically something that we have people just always looking at the next thing. And today, and let's pray, if you haven't already, um, Ukraine was invaded by Russia, if you don't already know that. And that's a whole mess, and it's hard to believe really anything with the mainstream media. But it looks pretty evident that Russia attacked Ukraine unprovoked, right? Now, does that mean, what does that mean for the Bible? What does that mean for eschatology? Well, I'll let Gary answer that question. Um, but we should pray for these people. We should pray for those in authority, First Timothy tells us. Uh, we should pray for um, those to live a quiet and peaceable life. We'll also pray for those who persecute us uh, as well and, and, and that sort of thing. So it's something that, you know, <laughs> I watched a video, David Wood, if you know him, he's been on YouTube a long, long time. He does mostly like Muslim apologetics, really, really crass and direct, pulls no punches. If you know David Wood, he's phenomenal. Uh, but he did a video on Twitter and just the response of some of these people on Twitter about uh, Franklin Graham saying, let's pray for Putin. And they took it out of context saying, hoping that there isn't war, right? No war. Let's, let's pray that there's no war, that Putin will, you know, cease this sort of thing. And people are like, this guy's wicked. He's evil. Billy Graham would be ashamed, blah, 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 blah. And you're like... He's, we're, first of all, we're called by Christ to pray for those who persecute, right? Pray for our enemies. Plus, we're pray for those in authority and that sort of thing. And so it's it's interesting. So again, those who are just joining us, we are waiting for Gary. He's going to be here um, in the next few minutes. Once he's here, I'll let him in and we'll let it go. On. But if you have a question, um, put question or Q at minimum, capital Q or question in the front of it, and then your question and that way I'll be able to read it to him if I don't get to your question try and ask it again I know we've got about 10 people that'll probably increase as far as uh, how many people so I don't want to miss anybody if I'm missing it I'm not ignoring you uh, just drop it in there again and let me know let's see left behind Matthew 24 Matthew 24 Daniel 7 there's a number of those that are very pivotal passages in the scripture uh, that we get a lot of our end times from uh, Pushing the Antithesis, also a really good book. Looks like the other one that I just looked at with the black cover. Uh, Restoring, Foundation of Civilization. Also, this is Gary DeMar. Great book. You can find these books on Amazon. Truthfully, you can do what you want. Well, within reason, of course. But I prefer to go like Christian Book or here or Canon Press or buy from, from the actual publisher. Uh, or a Christian outlet versus Amazon. Again, you can do what you want, but quite frankly, Amazon really isn't much cheaper most of the time, and you're actually helping out, cutting out the middleman, because Amazon's getting a profit from your uh, money, and they're a multinational conglomerate that hates all of our values. Right? Uh, again, you could buy stuff from Amazon. I'm not completely saying boycott them. They do support other smaller businesses. You can't buy stuff from you know your local Walmart or uh, Costco or something, but they still have... A lot, of, a lot of problems. The Rapture, here's another one, the Fig Tree Generation. So a lot of these are great, and you know, if your question doesn't get fully answered, I would encourage you to jump on American Vision, read some of these things here. Gary will probably tell uh, about fleshing out your question of, hey, you should check out this book, I read this book, or Gary North, or Ken Gentry wrote this book, or whatever. Um, you know, there's a Daniel 70th week. You know, are we in the middle of Daniel 70th week? What is a week? Is it a year? Is it a generation? Is it a thousand years? You know, all this other stuff. You know, this is one big thing that a dispensational uh, view has a problem with. Is, you know, we're, there's a gap between the 69th and 70th week. But, again, I'm not the expert Gary is. So, we're going to wait for him. And, uh, yeah. So, Gary DeMar's blog, Cash. You can see this here. Go ahead and go ahead and subscribe to him.
this is, uh, like I said, he reads his articles, similar to what Doug Wilson does. And then he's also got a regular podcast um, where it's, that's on Apple iTunes and Google and things like that. So, let's see here. Go back. Um, there was one or two other books I wanted to just share with you all real quick. I'm not seeing them though. Maybe I missed them. Me meaty tails. <laughs> what? Oh, this looks great. Should talking vegetables be used to teach the Bible? That's hilarious. I want to read that just because of the title. That sounds great. Veggie Tales has kind of gone off the rails in the last few years, though, especially Phil Vischer. Uh, that guy's kind of a joke. Sadly, sadly, but true. Welcome, everybody, who's uh, here yet. Gary, as you can tell, isn't here yet. Uh, there's a slight conflict in timing. Uh, which is just no big deal, so it's, we'll be gracious. Um, he will be here as soon as he's here. We'll get cracking. If you have a question, put Q or question. Get your questions ready. You don't have to ask them that if you don't yet, if you don't want. Uh, but if you want to, that's fine too. And if I miss you, because it might go through pretty quick, because um, it's just me moderating. If it's just you know, if you if I miss the question, drop it again. I'm not ignoring you. I'm all for dialogue and asking questions. This isn't a debate, uh, but this is a Q&A. So if you have a burning question about uh, end times or what does this mean, or uh, if you're a pre-mill or a-mill, um, there's basically four views, just so everybody's kind of clear. There's premillennial dispensational. That's what most Americans believe. It's very, very nominal anywhere else. Uh, and it's very non I'll be gracious, but not very historical. It's only been around for about 120 or so years. I understand some people would disagree with that, but that's really the fact of the matter. There's premillennial dispensational, where that's classic Rapture, Left Behind series, Kirk Cameron, Nick Cage, that whole thing. And then there's uh, Amil, which means without. It's like atheist or atheist, meaning the opposite of. So it's the opposite of millennial. So there's premillennial Rapture, Seven Year Tribulation, this whole thing. That's There's that. Uh, and premillennial dispensation. There's amillennial as well, no millennium, and then there's postmillennial. And within the premillennial, there's premillennial historic premillennial, which goes back a little bit further. Again, I'm not an expert, that's why we're talking to Gary. Uh, but I've changed quite a bit. In seminary, I didn't really get much at all. Most of the guys in seminary at Southern Seminary are amill, uh, and sometimes they would make fun of pre-mill, and we don't need to make fun of anybody. Let's not make fun of people. Let's rather encourage people and strengthen people, even if they're believers, um, and know that people hold positions for a reason. A lot of times people hold Calvinism or non-Calvinism just because that's all they've been taught, uh, or people are Roman Catholic or Methodist or whatever because that's all they've been taught, um, or Presbyterian, Baptist, whatever. I mean, I had an aversion to being any denomination in California, uh, because, you know, it's California, and it's live loose, man, just who, who cares, we're relaxed, I don't need a denomination, you know, the home of MacArthur, non-denominational, Calvary Chapel, non-denominational, and every other sect and cult and everything else, the land of fruits and nuts, uh, that's Greg Bonson, he would say that pretty regularly, he's he's a native Californian, uh, but it is the land of fruits and nuts because of, well, the fruits and the nuts, both people and things you eat, so... But let's be gracious, because the thing is, you hold views that may not be right, so do I, but we should be willing to hear opposing sides without instantly getting upset, or, oh, my skin, oh, it hurts, oh, I'm so thin, uh, and just kind of get all beat up. For what reason? I mean, just yelling or name-calling uh, ad hoc and ad hominem and pulling stuff out of the air is not helpful. So I hope that's what I like to do on this channel, uh, if I'm going in an opposing view or talking about something in general. I mean, most things when I talk about Contra Thoughts, my weekly sh or couple times a week show, you know, talking about different things. I'm going to be talking about First Baptist Orlando and their silliness tomorrow. There's quite a bit going on there. Uh, and yesterday I talked about why I don't pray to saints or Mary or anything. So that was pretty interesting. But, you know, there's Roman Catholics that believe that. Why do they believe that? Well, because they're dumb? Well, it's not because they're dumb. It's because that's what they've been taught. But where does your authority lie? Where, does, where should we go with this and that? And so 
yeah, that's really the the big difference, right? Where does your authority lie? Oh, I got a spam text from McDonald's. Look at that. Just checking my email here, see if everything's okay. Yeah. Um, so, again, if you have a question, put question and then your question. Type out question. All caps is preferable or at least a big capital Q. And if I miss it, ask it again. Uh, that would be very helpful just because I'm not going to ignore you. But let's try and be iron sharpening iron. So Gary should be here by 1.30, if not before that. Let's see. Does anybody have any questions for me? Let's let me scroll through here and check it out. Uh, Micah, yeah. Post mill Baptist. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm a Baptist because I'm I believe in believers' baptism. I believe, and I understand why Presbyterians and others do it covenantally. It doesn't wash away sin, whether you're a baby or not. That's not what baptism does. It's an inward expression of an outward reality, right? Uh, and I believe in the autonomy of the local church. We can all be thankful, and we're all Baptists at heart because we love America. If you love America, that is, and you love the Bill of Rights, freedom of uh, religion, freedom of speech. Uh, freedom of press, that's all Baptist ideals. There were John Witherspoon and many others were helpful and uh, influential in the uh, founding of our country and, and basically not having coerced, forced uh, conversions. And so that's another reason why I'm a Baptist. The other is just the autonomy of the local church overall. Did I say that? I don't know if I said that. So are we in the millennial reign now? I don't know. I don't know yet, Michael. I really don't know. Uh, I don't think so. I know, oh yeah, Lindsay just said, Jeff Durbin. Yeah, Jeff Durbin, you know, the big beard kind of crass guy, but he does a lot of great work. I know he's not for everybody. Um, the leftists and the moderates, quote unquote, the squishy kind of middle evangelicals hate him because he pulls no punches. You know, abortions, murder, that sort of thing. Like there's no, doesn't pull any punches. And that's good because, you know, the, the softness of, you know, this soft, everybody's going to appreciate us Christians. They don't, they, we believe in a guy who died and rose again from the dead, a dead carpenter who came back to life. Like you can't get around that, or you don't, and then you just you go off into universalism or liberalism or something like that, just unbelief, and that's just not helpful for anybody. That's not Christianity whatsoever. Uh, the Bible is a weird book. It's full of weird things. It's full of angels, right? Go back to Genesis, you know, incarnating somehow and having sex with women. Now a lot of people want to say, oh, that's well, uh, sons of Seth. No, it's not. <laughs> No, it's not. There was a global flood. There is there is global judgment. Uh, Christ is coming again. Elijah and Enoch disappeared. They did not die. I mean, there's all sorts of weird stuff. You know, axe heads are floating. Donkeys are talking. The Bible's weird. And just because it's weird doesn't make it wrong at all. In fact, it makes it great. And we live in a mysterious, uh, mystical world that we've sanitized in our modern church so much because we've been told to by the world. And we need to get back to that more mystery, that kind of, uh, you know, that... Tolkien and Lewis and a lot of these other guys, even Francis Schaeffer, a lot of these guys from last century really had a better understanding of we live in a supernatural world. Uh, so, yeah. So Jeff Durbin, I don't know how I got so far on that, but Jeff Durbin, uh, James White also, I believe they've both changed their views on end times in the last few years. Um, and I know they're both at the same church, Apology of Church there in Arizona. Let's see. Brain Babes. Hey, Violet. Uh, she asks, if you were not post-mill, what position would you hold? Probably historic pre-mill, probably, um, because the, I mean, a rapture is just not in the Bible. There's Thessalonians, I know the passage, but that could easily be attributed to second Christ's second coming. And it's like, there's the second coming before the second coming, uh, it just doesn't square. So that's like the only place that anybody who believes in a rapture will go to. And the other thing is too, when you believe in that, not always, but a lot of times people will say they're just looking for the rapture and they're just waiting and just kind of kick back and put your hand, uh, get some iced tea, lemonade, sit in the hammock and just wait around for Jesus to come. And well, we've been waiting around for 2000 years almost, right? I mean, people did that. I mean, they were rebuked for that in Acts chapter one, right? That's a big deal. And so we got to get to work we have work to do. And it looks like Gary just dropped in. Um, so let's go ahead. We'll bring Gary on. 
uh, and say hi. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? I don't hear you. You don't hear me. Uh oh. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me, Gary? Technical difficulties, bear with us, hold on. Is that any better? Can you hear me? No, I think he's having some tech issues. Um, let's see, maybe his speaker's not working. Pop this up. Me details, I'm gonna have to check that out. That looks funny. Um, yeah, premillennial, premillennial, traditional, pre pre traditional premillennial, probably what I would be. I don't know. I'm again, I'm not hard, hard and fast on anything yet, honestly, although I am leaning more and more post mill. So let's see. Can you hear me, Gary? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Am I supposed to be hearing you? Yeah. I don't hear you. Hmm. Can everybody hear Gary okay? If Gary has a mic plugged in, he needs headphones. Uh, settings. Audio. Let's see. One moment, everybody, please. Okay. All right? All right. All right. Okay. okay. You can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Somebody suggested headphones. I know sometimes if you have an external mic, uh, it will go through. That's why I'm wearing these guys. If you have headphones, that might be good, but if not, should be okay too. I mean, are you hearing me okay? I can hear you now. You can hear me okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, wonderful. Well, we've got a good crowd here, and we were just kind of going through some of your stuff. I was showing um, the... Oops. Oh, there we go. Yeah. There we go. Uh, just showing your website. I know you've got the podcast uh, that you do on Apple iTunes. And then, of course, you've got your uh, blog cast as well. So the blog cast is basically kind of what, like you and uh, like what Doug Wilson does as well, where you just read your, your blog. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't do that much anymore. I, it's, it's way too much work, too much edit. He's got people who can edit things and so forth, and I'm basically doing this by myself. Gotcha. So I'd rather just do a podcast and leave it, you know, let it go and from that but if i one of these days when i get an assistant i'll have somebody to help me do the editorial process on that gotcha gotcha very good well i was just introducing them to you i know some of uh some of the people who are here know you already uh do you want to share anything i just said that you know you're out of atlanta been at um, american vision for a long time written as many books as you've been there for each year which is pretty impressive 35 books 35 years <laughs> uh maybe more probably yeah i'm behind uh, i'm behind i've i've been here since uh Full time since 1981, uh, but I've got about four books that I need to complete, and I just haven't gotten around to do them because I'm doing stuff like this. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. But I, look, it's it's. <laughs> I, I, I You're need, helping us all, though. Yeah, I need to do it. Uh, like today, I just did a, <laughs> I just recorded a podcast on the whole Russia, Gog and Magog. Yeah. Ezekiel 38 stuff. Uh, that that will go up. Uh, tomorrow and then I, i've got a couple of i did this debate with michael brown on the 17th of february of this year and then i'm doing individual podcasts in response because it, it was an hour debate but i only got 30 he only got 30 minutes i only get 30 minutes mm -hmm. so much stuff came up that, you, that neither side can really answer in that you know in, in that short period of time so i'm doing individual uh, podcasts on that, and they will run uh, well until I quit doing them. But Monday, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday of next week, uh, yeah. at, at, at least. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, um, yeah, everybody check out Gary's stuff on both YouTube and especially on his website and Apple iTunes as well. Got a bunch of stuff there. So I was showing some of the books as well, talking about Last Day's Madness and a few other things. So let's get into it. Appreciate you joining us. Thank you again for, for the time. 
Uh, it's always a pleasure. Um, we have a few people, so if you do have a question, go ahead and drop a drop. Say question. This is for everybody watching. We've got about 13, 14 people. Uh, say question or Q, and then put your question in so I can see it easily. Um, let's see here. We've got somebody asked me if I wasn't post mill, which I'm not hard line fast that yet, but I think I'm on my way. Um, <laughs> But what, in fact, Gary, why don't you just kind of flesh us out? Because you've you've got such a better pedigree than me. Uh, give us the four. At least this is what I learned. There's premillennial, dispensational, traditional premillennial, amillennial, and postmillennial. Can you give us like an elevator pitch for each, so everybody kind of knows what we're talking about? Yeah, the the, the premillennial, the the, the the prefix is an indicator of where their their position stands in relationship to the thousand years of Revelation twenty. So Revelation 20 talks about a thousand years. So to be premillennial is to hold the position that Jesus will return before the thousand years pre, and the both the classic uh, or historic premill and the dispensational premill premills hold that position that Jesus returns before the thousand years. The premill also holds to the position that Jesus will reign on the earth for that 1,000 year period. Uh, the the post mill position because years, but Jesus does not reign on the earth for that thousand years, that thousand years. For the pre-mill, the thousand years is a literal 1,000 years. For the post mill, the thousand years is a symbolic number. Okay. Like most of, like most of the numbers in the book of Revelation. Yeah. It simply means a either a long, Long period of time, and the post mill and the all mill hold that kind of same interpretation of the thousand years. Okay. The symbolic God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. One day in the court of the Lord is better than a thousand days anywhere else. It's obvious that God owns the cattle. You know, you could say, well, how about two thousand years? Is that better? So mm -hmm. it's the number is symbolic. Gotcha. And then also, you have in Revelation chapter. Not Revelation, but Second uh, Peter three. You know, one day is is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. So, they yeah. so a thousand years is a symbolic number. The the um, the all mill does not see what what people claim is a millennium idea in that thousand years. You know, while thousand years is a millennium, th that does not mean that within that thousand period of, of that, that thousand years that what we think of a millennium is actually going on during that period of time. And of course, if you read Revelation 20, the all mills are right, that there's not, there's not a, there's nothing millennial in the, in the way that that, that, uh, that word is, is typically used. And so mm -hmm. the all mill is, is correct. You can, I don't think you can use Revelation 20 to uh, for any particular millennial view because it doesn't really describe what we think of as a millennium, and I, I've gotten away from the idea of postmillennialism and trying to make Revelation 20 fit uh, any of the uh, any of the eschatological millennial positions because it says very little in there, and you really have to shoehorn so much into that chapter. It says nothing about Jesus reigning on the earth. Um, doesn't say anything about, in fact, if you go back and look at early writings on um, the millennial issue, you will see that they don't even quote Revelation 20. They quote a lot of uh, Jewish uh, kind of mythology about the, the, what the future is going to hold. And it doesn't square at all with what you read in Revelation chapter 20. Yeah. And so, and, and I deal with that in a book that uh, I wrote along with Frank Gummerlock called um, uh, the early church in the end of the world, mm. where I go through a lot of these these early writers who claim that that dispensationalists and premillennialists claim that they are premillennial. Yet when you look at how they get there, they're really not quoting Revelation chapter twenty. Mm. So that so that's a I mean that's a that's a lot of discussion for it. I, I just do not I don't like the the phrase post millennial because it's wedded to Revelation twenty. And Revelation 20 just doesn't describe what e what postmillennialists say are gonna, is going to take place during that during that postmillennial millennium. Yeah. 
Yeah, I remember one of our conversations you had mentioned that um, as far as just like the, the millennium. It's like that's not the only thing. Now, obviously, everybody's looking for the end of the world, and we all, we all even the God-hating atheists, know that there's this paradise coming. At least I would, I would argue that because they have the knowledge of God somewhat in their heart. And that's why we see this transhumanism and this science and this utopian dream is, is, is in everybody, and it's been happening for yeah, you know, I, look, this is this is a wild. one of the things that I, I I try to get across to Christians. Well, Christ, like for example, right now, when and people say, "Oh well, Ru oh Russia's back in Bible prophecy again," based upon Ezekiel thirty-eight and thirty-nine. And almost any time something happens around the world with Russia or Israel or China, uh, the, the, you know, um, economically, the prophecy writers are just right there ready to pounce mm. on those things and say the end must be near. Well, while we're preoccupied with this eschatological end that's always near, it's always imminent, that we're always on the precipice of a, some great last day's eschatological end, the uh, the opposition out there is moving forward at, at, at a kinds of, of futuristic advances. Mm. And we've been doing this for so long that you know we're sitting on the sidelines while the, while the left atheists and so So forth, theology than than we do. Yeah, it's it's something that a lot of Christians just really haven't thought that much about. Don't sit on the sidelines. Yeah, no, that that was kind of what I was talking about before you came on. Was you know a lot of people, especially the premillennial rapture view. You know, we're just kind of waiting for the rapture. We're waiting for this thing. Like, okay, you know, is it going to happen? When's it going to happen? And just and really having a lot of people just completely inactive and not profitable. So I've got a couple questions here. Um, somebody, one of the guys asked me, let's see, where did it go? Um, there we go. Are we in the millennial reign now? Well, I kind of answered that question. If, if the, the all mill and the post mills uh, will say that the thousand years began when Jesus bound the strong man. And the, the New Testament talks about binding the strong man. You cannot enter the strong man's house unless you bind the strong man. So both the all mill and the post mill believe that that started during Jesus's ministry to, to some extent. And you know, Paul talks about God will soon cr crush Satan under, under your feet, uh, Romans 16, 20. And so when big people ask the question, are we living in the millennium right now? That doesn't answer the question. Uh, because, again, as I mentioned, Revelation 20 doesn't describe what we think of as a millennium. Mm. Uh, and according to the all-mail position and the post-mail position, the thousand years is just an extended period of time. Uh, but Revelation 20 doesn't actually re reflect millennial-type thinking. I would say what we're living in right now is we're we're living in the confines of God's kingdom, where God is God is the King, Jesus is enthroned, and we have been raised up with Him in Ephesians chapter two, we reign with Him, and we are in the midst of His kingdom, and God then passes judgment, temporal temporal judgment on on those who follow His kingdom principles, and so what we're seeing around the world today with abortion and homosexuality, uh, what's happening in, in, with Russia and Ukraine. Th these, are, these are temporal judgments of God. When you don't follow God's commandments, there are consequences to it. We are living in the midst of God's kingdom. That's the way it was in the Old Testament as, as well. But what we are not living in is what the New Testament, I think, describes as the wrath of God that was poured out on Israel as the... As the That came to an end. The Jews of that particular period of time were holding on to it. This mm. is what I think is happening in Second Peter chapter three, where Peter talks about the scoffers. They were scoffing because the temple was still standing, and Jesus said that temple was going to be destroyed. Uh, and in fact, uh, in the in AD sixty four, the mm -hmm. temple looked more glorious than ever. 
And then all of a sudden, the wrath of God is poured out over on, on the nation of Israel. Now, God warned them. He said, look, when you see Jerusalem, sir, on a local judgment and not a worldwide judgment. God poured out his wrath upon apostate Judaism. You see this in 1 Thessalonians chapters 1, 1 and 2. Um, so, in, in fact, John the Baptist said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Mm, yeah, this wasn't something that was going to be in the distant future. This was something that was poured out was going to be poured out on that particular generation. That's good. Um, we, yeah, let's. I want to explore more of that, but we got some other questions. Uh, Violet here from Berean Babes. She's got a YouTube channel. People should check out if they haven't already. Question says, "What's the weakest position of the post mill view?" That's a good question. I, and, and, and by the way, anytime you get in a de, in a debate about anything, one of the, the two things you need to know, you need to know the strongest position of your opposition and the and your weakest position. And they're oftentimes the same thing. Uh, so that, that's a good question. What's what's the what's the weakest part of the post mill position? And I, I, I think what the, I, I, my guess is is I would say. Today's con the condition that the world is in right now. And how can you say that things are going to change for the better when you look around you and see how bad things are? I think mm -hmm. that's probably the weakest position. Now, related to that is, however, there are a lot of there are a lot of people who look at, say, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, and other passages, and they see those pa those chapters as as dealing with. Uh, events in the distant future, wars and rumors of wars, uh, famines, earthquakes, sun, moon, and stars language, gospel being preached in the whole world. And they see that as, oh, but see, that's in, in my debate with Michael Brown uh, a, a week ago in, in um, February 17th of this year, uh, Michael Brown, you know, believes in a double fulfillment. He said, oh, yeah, those things happened with the destruction of Jerusalem in 8070, but it's going to happen again. Mm. So uh, that's convenient. Yeah. So what I try to do, yeah, what I try to do is to kind of clear the chessboard of, by dealing with those passages, prophetic passages like the Olivet Discourse, Second Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist language and the book of Revelation to show that these are not talking about some distant eschatological event. Mm. So once you do that, then you then now you have to get back to discipleship of the nations taking the gospel into all the world and not just converting people, but, uh, you know, discipling them, applying the Bible to every area of life. And, and most pulpits don't teach that sort of thing. They teach a very minuscule um, application of the Bible. You know, it's the, my, our goal is to get you saved so that when you die, you go to heaven. Well, that's the first step. That's so yeah. I think we have a very truncated, uh, diluted the gospel message. What are we saved from, and then what are we saved unto? And oftentimes we never get the unto part yeah. of what it means. So, so, I, that's a, again, that's a, a, a very good question that should be asked of a person who holds a particular position. Um, and so that would be my, my uh, answer to it. And, and I would add this to it. If you look through history, how many times have people prophetic people, prophetic works predicted the end. It was all inevitable. You saw all these things taking place. We published a book back in 2000 by Frank Gummerlock, mm -hmm. Day in the Hour, where he went through, you know, almost decade by decade of people looking see, looking at the same Bible verses that we you, that are people look at today, and they applied them to their particular period of time. And this was kind of a prophetic inevitability. And here we are, 2022, yeah. asking the same questions with the same verses that have been asked all this all this time. Yeah, I remember you telling me uh, I was in one of the conversations we had. What would you call it? Newspaper exegesis, uh, and uh, providentially we're here now with Ukraine being invaded by Russia uh, or attacked by Russia, even, which is it's just bad. I mean, it's bad. We should pray for these things. We should sure. pray, pray sure. to the end, and there's not some weird, you know, sadomasochistic destruction or any sort of weirdness. But at the same time, wars happen and have happened for centuries as well. And that, you know, does that mean something is fulfilled and, oh, we go back to Revelation and here's our playbook. I mean, I remember listening to MacArthur and I love a lot of what MacArthur says and, you know, especially in this lockdown crazy world we've lived in. But 
uh, it was like in the seventies and he was talking about Russia and this and that and how that's ma, ma, uh, 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 Gog and Magog and this and that. I almost said Blog and Mayblog. Uh, and, and and it's like this and this is half. It was like 1972. I, I, I worked through some of his old sermons for a while, uh, way back when. And it, this is in the 70s, you know. And you're like, golly, this is like 35 years ago. I'm listening to this. And anyway, so yeah. Well, you think of you know when I, I became a Christian in 1973. I was my senior year in college, and uh, what was big back then was Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth. And the late great planet Earth, uh, he 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 had a chapter in there called uh, uh, Russia is a Gog. Mm. And so so this so this was early 19s. This that book came out in 1970. That was 52 years ago wow. that he was predicting that Israel, because it became a nation again in 1948, and this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And generation was 40 years. So you had. You know, 40 to 1948, you get 1988. So the rapture should have taken place between 1981 and 1988. And here we are in 2022 going through the same stuff again. But yeah. see, but this gets back to what are we saved for? One thing to say what we're saved from, what are we saved for? And the things that we're seeing around the world today, if you have a worldview that says that war, wars and rumors of wars are what are predicted in the Bible, and we should expect these things, that's what you're going to end up doing. And I would say what Christians should be doing is they need to be working within their nations with Christians who are in there and working with their leadership uh, to say, no, this is not what we should be doing. I mean, Russia at one time was maybe not a Christian nation in terms of how, how we think of a Christian nation, but, you know, the Orthodox Church, you know, they, you know, they, they weren't warmongers. They, yeah. What we should be doing is what we should always do is is have a a worked out solution. Go into these countries and say no. We want our our our, our governments to stop the war mongering. We need to sit down and work with one another on fundamental, basic, shared principles and say we we're going to have to figure this thing out without going to war. Mm. Um, so. Amen. There's a lot more to this than a bunch of scripture passages. It's, it's, it's how we start applying the Bible beyond our narrow focus of, of prophetic passages. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, uh, Violet there, she asked, uh, again, what, what made you uh, become post-mill? I know you shared your testimony on one of the last videos. Um, I know you, so you wrote, you read, uh, well, I'll just let you tell it since it's your testimony. <laughs> well, you know, Pre-millennialism was just, to me, just no, no way, no way you could, you could uh, accept it because the fundamental principle of premillennialism is Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand years, and you can read, and you can read up and down Revelation chapter twenty, and it doesn't say anything like that. Yeah. I mean, the, and and that is the linchpin of their system. If the linchpin of your of your system is that Jesus reigns on the earth for a thousand years, you would at least like to have a passage that said that. It's kind of like the rapture, you know, those who hold that the church is going to be raptured either before or in the middle of or at the end of a seven year period. I want to know where that verse is. Yeah. Where, where in the Bible does it, does it say that? So premillennialism was out. And yet people say, oh, you mean you don't interpret the Bible literally? And I said, well, because I do interpret the Bible literally, I can't be a premillennialist because yeah. Revelation 20 doesn't say anything about it. Now, the Amil position uh is where I was for the you know for the longest time. I, I held the the amillennial position because the, it's kind of the default position after premillennialism. So once yeah. you abandon premillennialism, <laughs> then you become an amillennialist, and it's safe. You want to teach in a you know in some of these you know seminaries and so forth. Um, Amill is a good place to be, unless you're mm -hmm. going to go to you know Dallas Theological Seminary or somewhere else. Although they might take an am all millennialist if he keeps his mouth shut and, and he, <laughs> he doesn't write on the topic post mill position is i guess it's it's you know there's so many passages in the bible that talk about uh you know thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven applying the bible to every area of life discipleship of the nations um th those those types types of commands why give those types of commands if it's not possible and then I, you know, I looked down through history and I began to see how when Christians did apply the Bible consistently, how they transformed the world. Yeah. Uh, I mean, look, 
there are a lot of criticisms about the West. Uh, but when, when you look at the advances of the West and, and taking care of orphans and taking care of uh, and, and hospitals uh, and science and, uh, and art and music and so forth, that grew out of a post-millennial view. relatively new. Uh, and, if you, and if you look at those who first came over here, they were what we would call today post-millennial. They saw yeah. that they were advancing. They were, they were advancing within the confines of God's kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can, you can see the, you know, the shelf behind me. Uh, if, if, if there was a study down just technological development in the history of the world. And it was Gutenberg's printing press. <clears throat> And what came off was the first thing to come off Gutenberg's printing press. It's the Bible. That was, and that fixed, that fixed the way people thought of the world. Now today we've gotten away from that, and so now we have, you know, there's there's no there's no basis for human rights. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if evolution is true, you know, survival of the fittest. You just go on down the list with this. Where we've lost the 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 remnants of a Christian worldview are beginning to pay the price of it. And you, you wed that with Christians who say we're living in the end times, then it's a, it's a you know, witch's brew of complacency. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's something that I've, I've struggled with even pastoring the short time that I have of, of a level of apathy and complacency. Um, and, you know, being kind of in the Bible belt ish and everything else, you just, there's no, there's no sense of urgency and we don't always want to be like hyped up and, uh, and like crazy, but there should be a level of, we are in a war, we are battling, we are fighting. There is a war going on, you know, and it's not just this something far off in, you know, Western or Eastern Europe or something, but actual spiritual warfare that I think it kind of goes with the sanitization of the supernatural you know we don't we don't want to explain anything we still want to believe in a dead carpenter who rose from the dead but angels and this and demonic powers and uh, influence of this thing and that uh, i don't know that sounds all really weird i I don't want to be too freakish you know and we kind of we kind of we take the few things that jesus still rose from the dead but we ignore all the other stuff uh or even just stuff in the bible you know how you know sons of god daughters of uh man and that sort of thing and was that just well, sons you, of Seth, or was that actual angels becoming human-like? Right. Yeah. You know, that's weird, but that's really what the Bible says. And let's why don't we just believe that instead of kind of massaging away into something well, else? I'm not sure that's what that p- p- passage is teaching. Oh, me. oh, it's on Gary. No, I, I, th- I think Doug Wilson takes that position. One of these days, I'm going to sit down with Doug, and I've written this extensive study of of, of this. But that's a, that's another that's another question. I, yeah. My point is. When a pastor gets up in the pulpit and pe- pe- uh, preaches through the Bible or teaches through the Bible, oftentimes they leave out what the Bible says in terms of worldview issues. I'll give you a very good example of this. When I was in seminary, Dr. Gary North came. Uh, uh, this would have been in the late in the late seventies, and Gary North has written an economic commentary in the Bible. So thirty-five volumes on. On every book of the Bible and every verse in the Bible and how it deals with economics, hmm. um, and and that's the kind of work you have to do. Jerry Boyer has written a book called the the Maker versus the Takers, which goes into the New Testament and shows the importance of geography as it relates to dealing with a lot of this economic stuff. Well, when I was in seminary and when Gary North was there, there was a it wasn't a a, a face to face debate, but it was a Kind of a, 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 a kind of worldview to worldview debate on various topics uh, with a professor from Fuller Log- Logical uh, Fuller uh, Il- uh, Theological Seminary, um, and, and remember Gary North gave this this uh, the exposition of Isaiah chapter one where you're, it says your silver has become dross, your wine diluted with water, mm-hmm. and what Gary North says is, is says look that is an economic verse. That is a moral. That is a moral verse. That is economic repercussions, and he explained very simply that the Bible has just weights and measures, and so if somebody has wine, and by the way, it's not grape juice. If people have wine and they're selling it 
as, as a, a un, undiluted wine, and then they come along and say, hey, what we're going to do here, we're going to add, let's say, 20% more water to it and sell it as the real thing, that is theft. Yeah. And if they took a, a, a valuable metal like gold and um, added a base metal to it and tried to sell the thing off as, you know, fully, you know, 0.999 percent gold, um, uh, fine gold. That's that is in fact theft. But when and then Gary North went on to say, but that's exactly what our government does. Our government just prints money. Yeah. And 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 look, inflation is not the definition of inflation is not rising prices. The definition of inflation is the dilution of the money supply. Mm-hmm. The value of the money supply. So if you have a million dollars and you add another two hundred thousand dollars, you devalued the first million dollars. And so what you get out of that, of course, is higher prices because more money chases the same number of goods. And as a result, because the demand goes up, the price goes up because people they they, they can't keep things in stock anymore because there's so much money chasing it all. But mm-hmm. most most Christians, and if you've ever looked at a a, a dime, a, a quarter, a half dollar, and a, and, a, and a dollar, you'll note that there are little ridges on those coins. And if you and and but a penny and a, and a nickel don't have those ridges on those coins. Well, why is that? Well, because our coinage, the dime, the quarter, the half dollar, and, and the silver dollar, the, the 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 dollar coin, used to be silver. Yeah. And what, if you didn't have those ridges on there, people would actually take a very sharp knife and clip off some of the silver, and they would do the same thing with gold. Gold's much softer than than, than silver, and and shave off some of the stuff and then take it to an assayer's office and get money for it while still having the original coin and passing that off as the real thing. See, that is biblical application to the world in which we live that Christ, most Christians don't know anything about. Yeah. Because they're not taught it from the pulpit, and because pastors aren't trained to teach it from the pulpit, and and, and and in many respects, don't believe that the Bible actually addresses the issues of the day, mm-hmm. and so that's that's where we are as a nation today. Christians don't have a handle on how to deal with these issues because they've never been taught, and they they have this thing, this strange idea that somehow we shouldn't be involved in these things because Jesus never got involved in these things either. Well, Jesus right. didn't get married and have children or own a house or, a, or 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 even a donkey to ride on. So you want to be consistent with that. You consider what you would have to do. Yeah. What's what's a quick book? And then we got a, we got another question. Um, what's a book that even even me as a pastor, what should I or others read to kind of get a better, more robust understanding of, of something like what you're saying with the Bible does deal with. I mean, we can understand from some verses, okay, yeah, of course, this is how you should live. But there's other stuff like economics, politics, and things. A lot of people, it's like, oh, ho, oh, no, no, no. We don't, we don't want to get involved. Yeah, I know. What do you suggest? What do you think? I would, look, as an introduction to all this, there's a book uh, that was uh, written by uh, Vishal Mangawaldi, who's uh, from India, a Christian. Oh, yeah. A book is published from, by Thomas Nelson called The Book That Made Your World. The book that made your world by Vishal Mangawaldi, and it is a and I I would start well, I would start with chapter fourteen on morality, and I, when you read that chapter, you will get a sense of the spillover effect of Christian ethics, the teaching of Christian ethics, and how what it means for the world at large for people who aren't Christians. Mm. We've lost that. Um, so that's a good place to start. I have a book called Thinking Straight in a Crooked World mm. that deals with a lot of these issues, myths, lies, and half-truths. Uh, uh, I have a, a, a book called God and Government, uh, which is very comprehensive, where I, I show that government is not synonymous with politics. Civil government was one aspect of government, but there's self-government, family government, church government, civil government, decentralized civil government, education, economics, dealing with the poor, uh, that's God and government, and all these things, all, all these books are available at AmericanVision.org. Perfect. 
Uh, Jeff Wilburn has a question. The two witnesses of Revelation 11, I've always believed that two actual men, but no after transit, but I guess now maybe after transitioning, uh, he said no, but maybe after transitioning to this view, could this represent the law and the prophets? Uh what, what the book of Revel? It's funny. I'll, I'll do a whole series on on eschatology, and almost in, invariably, the first question I get is, "Who do, who do you think the two witnesses are?" Um, but it's a, it's a good, again a good question. So now we have to go and we have to determine uh, what era is this talking about. Um, I believe that the book of Revelation was written before the destruction of Jerusalem in AD seventy. The temple was still standing, and and uh, in, in Revelation chapter 11, uh, uh, John says that he was a fellow partaker in the tribulation, which would have meant this tribulation was going on. There were seven actual churches in Asia Minor that were in existence at that period of time. Uh, Revelation 1, 1 and 1, 3, 22, 10 say the time is near. This, th these things must shortly take place. Mm. So and then the next thing is you have to say, well, the book of Revelation is written in signage. Uh, these things are signified or signified. And so if, if um, Jerusalem is defined as uh, Sodom and Egypt and Balaam is mentioned and Jezebel is, is mentioned, Babylon is mentioned, Gog and Magog are mentioned, these are Old Testament symbols representing things from the Old Testament that are being pulled into the book of Revelation. And so I, the... I'm, I'm reading this uh, to represent the law and the prophets. I think that's pretty close. I think what you, these two witnesses are, there is an Elijah witness and a Moses witness. And what's mm. all bound up in that? Uh, some, some say it was, you know, it was maybe uh, uh, Peter and Paul. I don't think that's necessary to do that. I think the witnesses are, because the, there's a lot of some symbolism in the chapter. There are two lampstands, it says, there's a lot of symbolism that's going on there, but I think that the the, uh, the, the post is is correct. This represents Elijah power and Mosaic power. What's going on there, and the 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 rebels against the things of Christ uh, attack them. Hmm. Just like they were attacked in, in, under the old covenant. When Elijah was attacked. Uh, Moses Moses, in fact, there's this rebellion going on. They were in here in the land of Canaan. You know, they're, they're, they're in the wilderness trying to get into the land of Canaan. He's constantly being attacked by, by the opposition. So that's probably probably what's really going on there. Okay. Uh, Fran Marie has a, has a slight rebuttal. The two witnesses are killed and raised three days later. Sounds like real people to me. What do you think about that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm to be dogmatic uh, about it, but uh, uh, the... I, I could take this. Look, the whole Bible, the whole book of Revelation is symbolic. Three days is a, is resurrection. Mm -hmm. They try to kill these guys, try to kill the principles that they represent, but they couldn't do it. They were raised back up again. Mosaic, Mosaic and Elijah power is not diminished by people who are trying to kill it. So, mm -hmm. but again, there's you know I don't I don't know how dogmatic I can be and other people can be about that, but. Uh, I would have an explanation for it based upon the signified or signified of what the book of Revelation is all about. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard, I mean, I know we have the two classic Enoch and Elijah, speaking of Elijah, were both didn't die. I've heard that. I think MacArthur said that, so obviously he's coming from the more pre-mill uh, dispensational view, uh, but that they would come back in some way. Uh, of course, yeah. Moses, we don't know how Moses was buried, God, you know. Uh, argued with her the, John, John the, the devil Baptist, argued about the body of Moses yeah, John the Baptist is the fulfillment of the promise of the of the return of Elijah I mean Jesus he, it's it's so clear about that and, and what, what does he do he you know here's here's a poss possibility here you see where where um, uh, John the Baptist is murdered yeah uh, he's, he's he's killed for his for his principles but who what does he do? What's what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to lead the way for one who could not be killed, even though he was killed. So this idea of a resurrection after someone trying to kill you is not an unusual thing. But I think because the book of Revelation is just loaded with with symbols here, you see, if you take the position that there are really two men, then, then what do you do about this giant woman 
who stands on the moon as you know has a big enough that she can hold 12 stars on her uh, you know on, on, on her head a crown yeah and then, and then um, fireproof enough that she's got you know uh, she can withstand the sun being enveloped around her so you, you know you you you're you, you extremes you have to go to in order to make this seem so literal then you got you got revelation chapter six where it says that the the dragon the dragon swept away i think it's revelation six or maybe revelation uh, 12 but a, a third of the stars are thrown down to the earth well mm. i'm telling you if the third of the star if those are literal stars thrown down to the earth and stars in the bible in many cases are literal and you got a real problem on your hands because now you got chapter seven through twenty-two. Uh, there are all kinds of things happening. Yet, yet you destroyed the earth in, in, in chapter six, and then it happens again in Revelation chapter twelve. Yeah. Uh, so again, uh, you know, one star would destroy our planet. I mean, completely oh, yeah. eviscerate it. <laughs> Let alone a third of the millions of stars that are out there. Like. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's hard. It's hard to take that literally. Yeah. Someone said, "Oh, that's their meteorites." Oh, really? So you have a third of the meteorite meteors in in, in heaven. You just that this, doesn't solve it. No, <laughs> yeah, that doesn't work either. Problem because I, you can go in the Book of Revelation, find things which seem to be very literal and, and tactile and so forth, and you can find lots of things in there. Most of them um, just just do not lend themselves to a. I hate to use the word literal because because everything in the Book of Revelation is literal. Because mm -hmm. you have, but you have to interpret it according to the literature. That's what literal means. Yeah. Literal, you know, there's physical and and, and spiritual. Um, you know, Jesus says, "Where two or three, are, uh, two or three are gathered in in my name, there I am in the midst of them." Oh, really? Physically? You know, come on. So, yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not I'm not uh, ridiculing the question and saying well, they sound like two two people. To real people but to be consistent there's a lot more you'd have to do in the book of revelation or do that yeah uh fran marie asks again she said she heard today uh that a guy on youtube thinks there's seven raptures sounds sketchy he's a baptist <laughs> <laughs> those crazy baptists all always cooking seven, up something seven raptures well let me do, first let's define rapture what we're talking about the rapture position says that the church will be taken off the earth prior to, before, pre, sometime in the middle, mid-trib. So you got pre-trib, mid-trib, and then a post-trib that Jesus returns after the seven, the seven years, after there's been this havoc wrecked on earth. And then there's a, another position called the pre-wrath position, which means that we, we go through the tribulation, but you're, the church is raptured before God pours his wrath out upon, get this, on Israel. So God waits 2,000 years to deal with Israel again, and he lets the Antichrist take over and kill literally millions and millions and millions and millions of Christians. There isn't a single verse in the Bible anywhere that says anything about the church being taken off the earth before, during, or after a seven-year period. Uh, so none of the there are no there are no rapture positions yeah. because the thing falls apart in terms of its definition. The whole rapture thing was concocted in order to keep Israel and this supposed new entity called the church separate. Hmm. Like God couldn't deal with Israel and the church at the same time. Well, the Book of Acts certainly doesn't doesn't fit that. Uh, and the church, the, the ecclesia, the church was not a new thing. Uh, the, the, the first members of the ecclesia in the book of Acts were all Jews. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen right. talks about the ecclesia in the wilderness, uh, Hebrews chapter 2. I mean, it, it's, and this is, I had my de de debate with Michael Bryan, my first debate with Michael Bryan. I went through all of this. And the big, and I tell you where this really, really messed up everything that the translators of the King James Version of the Bible translated Ecclesia as church. That is not the, that was never the proper translation. William Tyndale, in his translation, translated Ecclesia as congregation or assembly. And so when you go back to Acts chapter 7, 
uh, you'll find more modern translations translating uh, ecclesia as the congregation or assembly in the wilderness. Mm. Uh, although the King James, the King James Bible uh, translation translates ecclesia as the, the church in the wilderness. But supposedly the church was a new thing in the New Testament. It's it's really a it's all crazy. It really yeah. is crazy stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. I think some and just for everybody watching, uh, some of the questions I'm I'm seeing now. I'm I'm about half hour behind. It looks like, uh, but some of the questions have already been answered. So that's why they're not coming up. Uh, back on the screen. Let's see. Yeah, Violet asked her questions again. Let's see. Uh, all right. Bottom line, Dad. He asks Dr. Demar, what would you say is the best quote unquote position on end times and why? Briefly, in a nutshell. A mine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> mine is right. the best position. Yeah. <laughs> and why? Because it's mine. It's that's my right. Position. Uh, <laughs> that's not an easy thing to to to, to answer. I I believe that the majority of passages in the New Testament have nothing to do with what we say are the end times. Mm. I say that the majority of his positions in the prophetic texts in the New Testament have nothing to do with what we consider the end times. They have to do with the judgment on that particular generation. And that's what when Jesus says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. He was referring to that generation and that generation alone. And you can follow this if you go back to Matthew chapter 11 and, and uh, 12. Jesus was identifying that generation. If you look at uh, Matthew chapter 10, the, the, the apostles were only to go through the cities of Israel. And Jesus said, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. Mm. Now, unless the, the, the apostles are still going through the cities of Israel, uh, Jesus was referring to his coming in judgment that took place before that generation passed away. And in Matthew chapter 16, 27 and 28, it says, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Well, unless somebody is from that group is still alive today, that has been fulfilled. Yeah. If you go from Matthew chapter 1 through Matthew chapter 23, you will see very clearly that Jesus is dealing with that generation alone. So much so that the religious leaders said that his parables, that they Jesus was talking about them, mm. not talking about some future generation. And if you look at uh, uh, Matthew chapter 23, Jesus in, indicts the religious leaders of that day. Uh, and, you know, the, it's, it's, it's so clear, but people still want to hold on to this kind of end time cataclysm. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so the, the best position on the end times is, in fact, the position that takes seriously the New Testament time indicators. This generation will not pass away until all the th these things take place. The, 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 um, what aud the audience, notice that, that Jesus uses the second person plural throughout Matthew chapter 24. He does a chapter 21, chapter 2, chapter 22, chapter 23. Um, so the time indicators, audience relevance, and the idea that that the disciples ask about the end of the age, Matthew yeah. 24, 3, not the end of the cosmos, not the end of the world. Yeah, and I think there's, I remember you shared that, that kind of opened my eyes a lot with, uh, like the gospel will be preached in the whole world, but that's actually uh, what is it? O o oikomene, right? Oikomene, yeah. Which is is inhabited, right? House inhabited, right? And and the known world, not down to Australia and up to Russia and everything else in between. Yeah. Yeah. But we think that, and we take those marching orders, and yeah, we should still preach the gospel, of course. But that doesn't necessarily apply to modern missions, you know. And oh, these people out in the middle of Africa still haven't heard the gospel yet. Right. Jesus hasn't come yet. And, and we kind of go off on this road, you know, one thing that I've really, really seen, um, especially in a pre-mill California West Coast, because most people out on the West Coast are pre-mill uh, dispensational, uh, not everybody, but most, is there's almost no relevance uh, for 70 AD, the temple, the destruction of Jerusalem, and anything like that. And I think, I don't know if that's intentional or unintentional, but once you understand, at least for me, uh, that... That actually is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew, what is it, 24, right? You yes. know, the ju coming in judgment. And, you know, if he's crucified in 30, he gets 40 years. That is a generation. 30 to 70 is 
40 years. I mean, there's multiple places that then start to line up and say, oh, 40 years in the wilderness. Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days. You know, it rained on the earth for 40 days with Noah's flood. I mean, on and on and on the numbers. Um, there are certain numbers, of course, in the Bible that, that do parallel each other. But, you know, it's God closed that chapter, right? And that age closed, right? And I think you've said it, like there's this kind of overlap uh, of, of the Jews having Christ and then the first Christians and then that going to the Gentiles. Yeah, um, look. Yeah, you mentioned Matthew twenty four fourteen about the gospel being preached in the whole oikumene. That word is used in Luke two one, uh, and while Rome would have liked to have been able to tax the entire right world, and he's used there that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole oikumene be taxed. Mm -hmm. There was a famine. There was a famine mentioned in, in Acts chapter eleven. Uh, and uh, it says the famine was over the whole world, if you read the, some of these translations. But it was over the oikumene, not over the yeah. whole wide world. So that, so that, so that takes care of that. In, in verse 15, when you see, when you see the abomination of desolation standing in the place where it ought not to be. And then Luke says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies. And, and then you go down a little, you go down a little further and you see, uh, well, look, if, if you're on your rooftop, you know, don't go down and get, get your cloak. What, my roo rooftop? When's the last time anybody was on a roof other than to put shingles on it or, or clean out gutters? Uh, but that was standard in those, in, in, in those days to have a rooftop. I and mean, there was actually a situation in the Bible where somebody couldn't get to Jesus and they went up on the roof and lowered him down. Um, Pray that your 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 flight not take place on the Sabbath. The Sabbath. Well, how would that affect any modern any modern day culture today on on the Sabbath? Hmm, Pray yeah. that your 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 flight might might not be in the winter time, or if you're with with child in in, in those days, uh, you could escape that great tribulation on foot by just going to the mountains. That's hmm. what Matthew twenty four says. Uh, so. Anyway, that, and that tribulation was, in fact, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., correct? Oh, yeah. Oh, most okay. definitely. Just make and, sure and, everybody's and even, on the same page. Even, even verse 21 says there will never be a tribulation greater. There was never one before this that was greater and never one after this will be greater. Hmm. And it's almost an exact quote. Uh, where the same language is used. And Jesus pulls that in here and he applies it there. And why was that particular tribulation greater than anything that took place before or anything that will take place after? Because Israel was the only God to be in a covenantal relationship with him. And when God brought wrath down on them, there could be no greater tribulation for any group of people because this was, in fact, God relationship that he had with that particular generation alone. He didn't break mm -hmm. his covenant with the Jews because the first believers were, in fact, Christians. Right. But he broke the he broke this special bond that he, that was was created under the old covenant. But they were supposed to be a beacon, you know, to the world. Deuteronomy chapter four, and that judgment. Is, is found, you can read Leviticus 26 and 28. This was all written down beforehand that this particular type of event would happen, even to the point of people eating their own children because they were starving to death, something mm. that did in fact happen during the, the siege on Jerusalem. Yeah, that's so, ugh, can't imagine the desperation. Um, uh, Violet asked again here, Berean Babes, do you think Romans 11 and this, uh, do you think Romans 11, do you, Sorry. Do you think Romans 11, uh, the church replaces Israel, or is it separate? Does it tie into eschatology? I know you kind of just mentioned that a little bit with the, of course, the first Christians were Jews. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, this idea that uh, the, the church and Israel are, are uh, that the church came along after God stopped the prophetic clock on Israel, and then now God's going to deal with the church. The Bible doesn't teach that at all. The mm. church is not a new entity. If you if you read the if if you get a if you pick up the uh, the Septuagint, the Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew. And you look up 
the instances of where the Hebrew word kahal play, uh, is, is found, you will find that the church. Uh, and so it's, that's all over the Old Testament. Ecclesia is all over the Old Testament since it, because it simply means assembly or, or, or um, a congregation. Yeah, gathering. Uh, I've heard that said too. Yeah. Okay. And so you get to, to the ecclesia. Wait a minute, I thought the ecclesia was to be something new. No, it wasn't anything new. Gotcha. Uh, and then you, so you get to the, you, you get to the book of Acts, and the, the first, of the, the first believers were Jews, and they made up the ecclesia. So, there, the idea that the church replaces Israel, absolutely not. That's that there are two different, there are two different entities. In one sense, they're not. Mm-hmm. The church simply just means the God. Now, Revelation, uh, Romans 11, uh, if you, if you, in fact, I'm going to pull my Bible out for this. I want to make sure I get it right. Yeah. Uh, almost all of the prophetic systems get, I think, get this wrong. Uh, so if you look at Romans chapter 11, um, verse 1, I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? The obvious answer is No. And he says, may it never be, for I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God uh, against Israel? Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they have torn down thine altars, and I alone am left, and Mm. uh, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So Paul goes back and he says, look, there's always been a remnant of believers in Israel. Today, during Paul's day, that's that's the case. That's true. And and evidence for that? Paul says, I'm a I'm a believer. God has rejected his people. This isn't. This is not describing something that's going to take place in the distant future. This was something that was taking that was taking place in Paul's day. Look at the next verse. Look at verse five. In the same way, then, there has come also come about at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious, gracious choice. And so, this idea of you know replacement theology and so forth and all no absolutely not there was always a remnant in the old testament there was a remnant in the new testament that paul makes this very clear in romans chapters 9 10 and 11. yeah uh, this was israel was all of the promises being made to israel were being fulfilled during that period of time and just like just like elijah who was trying to be killed by by those who opposed him, Jezebel and Ahab and so forth, where he had to hide and, and, and all that sort of thing. The same, read the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. You had two groups of, of, of Jewish people, believers and unbelievers. And those unbelievers were trying to stamp out the gospel. They were trying to, in many cases, trying to kill the Jews. Stephen was martyred. James, the brother of John, was martyred. A lot of these Jews took an oath in order to, be, in the, you know, they would take an oath and wouldn't eat anything until they murdered Paul. They used the Roman government in order to, like they used against Jesus, mm, uh, yeah. to try to get Paul Paul killed. You see, this th- this is not talking about something in the distant future. A, 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 an unbeliever today, a Jewish unbeliever today, is no different from a Gentile unbeliever today. They both need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, period. Yeah. End of story. Yeah, and that really, I, remember, I, I was able to go to Israel a few years ago, and it was through a ministry called Passages. And it's basically, it's a Christian organization, uh, but they have a very, I'm pretty sure they're definitely um, premillennial, I think, dispensational as well. And so there's a heavy influence of Israel becoming a nation and we want to support Israel, this and this and this. And I'm not going to say there's anything wrong with that per se, uh, as far as just the support of, you know, a foreign nation, I guess, uh, an ally in the Middle East. But as far as prophecy and everything else, I remember being there and we did a, it was almost like a study trip. There was a bunch of different lectures and other things. 
And even before this, and still coming out of and wrestling with premillennial, and that was the church we preached, uh, that was the church we went to, we remember that, uh, preached this. It was a kind of a church plant from MacArthur's church, uh, sort of. Um, and technically, MacArthur's dad planted this church. And then <laughs> before MacArthur was at that church, he went to Grace Community Church after. Anyway, um, so it's in Southern California, very disbelief, theology, and all that. And I remember thinking, like, but it sounds like these people, Gentiles, are saved this way, and Jews are saved this way. But, like, there's only one gospel, though. Like, And, and there wasn't really ever, like, an, a, a, a clarity of, oh, this is what this means. You know, it's, it was that's how it was taught without saying that, if that makes sense. And there's just a number of, like, and hearing replacement theology. We're not replacement theology. We love Israel. And God will deal with them, and da 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 It's like dealing with them differently than he deals with everyone else. Just, like, that doesn't really... Am I wrong here? Like, what, what did yeah. I miss? Again, and there's, yeah. There's just think, you know, you know, think about this a, a moment. Their position is that God's going to deal with Israel, so a, a single generation in the future, God's going to deal with Israel again after this rapture of the church, which, by the way, there isn't a single verse in the New Testament that says anything about the rapture of the church taken off the earth before, during, or after a, a seven-year period. People can go to First Thessalonians 4 and say, well, there it is right there. You won't find anything about an Antichrist. You won't see anything about seven years. You won't see anything like that. It's not. It's just not there. Traditionally, yeah. that particular passage has been used for what we call the second coming of Christ. And there's even some dis dispute about that. And so so here we're supposed to believe that the churches, they love Israel. We're going to take, we're going to take, we're going to take, uh, uh, we're going to go to Israel. We love Israel. We're teaching in the rapture, which means the church is going to take it off, off the earth. And then they come along and say, well, two-thirds of the Jews living in Israel during the Great Tribulation are going to be slaughtered. Mm. Now, that's not, that's not my opinion of what I think they believe. That is exactly what they believe. And I, if you go to AmericanVision.org, I have an article up there uh, that went up this, this week. You can, you can find it. And I have all these, these direct quotations from, uh, you know, from them. And in my debate with, with, with uh, Dr. Brown, he holds this um, double fulfillment, which means, and he doesn't believe that that tribulation in, in verse 21 of Matthew 24 was the greatest tribulation ever. And then he points to the Holocaust. He said, Gary, how can you believe that that, uh, that was, the, that was the, um, the greatest tribulation ever when the Holocaust, where there's six million Jews killed? Well, according to his view and this double fulfillment idea, that and, and that revel and, and Matthew 24 21 has not been fulfilled yet, and that means there has to be another great tribulation on the Jews that exceeds six million. Mm. Uh, and others have noticed this for, and within, within our position. There was a fellow at the Democratic National Convention a number of years ago who got on mic and camera. And mentioned this. He said, oh, "All these these Christians, all they care about in Israel is that they're going to be slaughtered because it's going to bring Jesus back." Mm. They, wow. Yeah. And I, if, if I could if I could pull this thing up, I don't know if I've got my article here where I could if I could pu pull these up and some of these 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 quotations. Um, well, I can't. I, I don't want to mess this thing up where I end up having to do that. But I've got all these quotations in uh, here. Uh, let me see if I can uh, maybe do it this way. Um, what 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 verse does it talk about that in Revelation? The two thirds will be slaughtered. Not in Revelation. It is in oh. uh, Zechariah uh, chapter thirteen, verses uh, seven through nine. Let me just make sure I'm back here with you here. Okay, okay. I'm going to read a couple of these. Uh, let's see. Charles Ryrie, Charles Ryrie, dispensationalist. Um, and had that restored Israel war experience, and I'm quoting now, the worst bloodbath in Jewish history. Mm. John Walvert, a dispensationalist, wrote that, I'm quoting, Israel is destined to have a particular time of suffering which will eclipse anything that it has known in the past. The people of Israel are placing themselves within the vortex of this future whirlwind, which will destroy the majority of those living in the land of Palestine. Well, friends, if that's the case, why are you excited about Jews going 
moving back to Israel. Yeah. Remember, well, if you look at Matthew 24, Jesus told him to get out of town. Arnold uh, uh, Fruchtenbaum, uh, during the Great Tribulation, I'm quoting, Israel will suffer tremendous persecution. As a result of this persecution of the Jewish people, two-thirds are going to be killed. Um, Eugene Merrill, quoting now, the redemption of Israel will be accomplished on the ruins of her own suffering and those of the malevolent powers of this world that in the last day will consolidate themselves against her and seek to uh, interdict forever uh, mm. any possibility of, of her success. The nations of the whole earth will come against Jerusalem and having defeated her, will divide up the spoils of war in their midst. I've got Walter Kaiser, Jack Van Empe, Sid Roth, Dave, David Hunt. Um, wow. uh, and let me just read you this thing from this, this uh, Jewish fellow, Mark Allen Siegel. This was at the 2012 Democratic National Convention. I'm quoting now. The Christians just want us to be there so we can be slaughtered and converted and bring on the second coming of Jesus Christ. The worst possible allies for the Jewish state are the fundamentalist Christians who want Jews to die and convert so they can bring on the second coming of their Lord. It is a false wow. friendship. They are seeking their own ends and not ours. I don't believe the fundamentalists urging a greater Israel are friends of the Jewish state. Uh, I mean, it's, it's just most people don't have, have never heard this. I had a debate with Thomas Eisen. I've never, yeah, I've never heard this. Yeah. And Thomas Eisen, I brought this up in our concluding remarks, and he said, well, well, Gary, that's what the Bible teaches, and I believe it teaches that too. By the way, I believe that two thirds of the of, of, of Israel were in fact uh, going to be come under the wrath of God, and that took place with the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. seventy. But keep this in mind. Here's the difference: Jesus warned them for forty years about this, yeah. and told them that when they saw Jerusalem surrounded by armies, to get out of town. So they had ample time to do what Jesus said was going to happen. All the signs were there. Uh, that gener it was going to happen to their gener their generation. Uh, they they were to be on watch watch for this in in, in Matthew chapter twenty four. Head for the hills, mm -hmm. Jesus said. So there's a big difference in this being predicted and the warnings that were were given. But see the dispensationalists teach well. Well, Christians aren't going to go through this tribulation period. They're going to be raptured and taken off the earth. But the poor Jews during this this future Holocaust, you know, they're going to be destroyed. In fact, during what was happening to Israel during World War II, uh, it's amazing to read the literature coming out of Christians about this, that they took what was described as a hands-off approach because they believed it was a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. There's an excellent wow. book on this called Armageddon Now by Dwight Wilson. But most people, look, most people who hear about Bible prophecy know nothing about any of this. And I guess that's why I'm here. You yeah. Know, kind of alerting Christians. Look, I, I haven't made this stuff up. Uh, yeah. If you're interested, you, know, you can get my book, Last Day's Madness, Wars and Rumors of Wars, Is Jesus Coming Soon? They're all available. Uh, at AmericanVision.org, I wrote a book called The Gog and Magog Alliance on Ezekiel 38 and 39, all available at AmericanVision.org. You can go to my website, AmericanVision.org. Uh, there's that article I was reading from is, is up there. You can let's see what the title of it is. Um, the title of it is uh, Premillennialism Requires Another Jewish Holocaust and Maybe More. Wow. Uh, and you just heard me quote these guys. It wasn't something I'm, this isn't my opinion on what they were saying. That's exactly what they were saying. And yeah. I, I supply the footnotes as well. Um, I've got, do you get, you got another, you got some more time? Do you have another yeah, half not, hour? Not, not much more, but I do have some more okay. time. Okay. Well, let me, let me know whenever we need to wrap up and we'll wrap up. Uh, Jasmine Baker here says, and this is a, one question that I've heard a lot. Isn't the state of the earth getting worse? Subjective. Is it, are things getting going from bad to worse? We see that. Look around all this crazy sin and everything. Flesh that out a little bit for us. Again, that's a good question. That's one of those things. How can you believe this stuff when the earth is getting worse and worse and worse? Um, uh, P.J. O'Rourke just died. I don't know if you know anything about P.J. O'Rourke. Hmm. Uh, kind of a, 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 a commenter on culture, very witty, uh, very perceptive. Uh, he just died a couple of days ago. And... Uh, <laughs> He had this saying, um, 
when you when, when you want to return when you think you want to return to the good old days think dentistry uh and that's funny before anesthesia before antibiotics before the automobile everybody thinks oh the automobile is a big polluter yeah yeah compare that to what what city streets were like with horse horse driven carriages mm. and in the summertime uh when the heat hit the uh the excrement and the dust went in the air and people coughed in the summertime the slush and so forth and so on mm. so on that side of things so that's on that side of things you cannot say that things are worse things are better uh you get you get a uh, uh, an infection. I'll, I'll give you a good example of this. Uh, January of last year, 2021, um, uh, I had, I guess it was February. I can't, I can't remember because uh, I was under anesthesia. Time, time I, had, yeah. I, had my, I had my left kidney removed because it had a cancerous, cancerous growth on it. Hmm. I was home in two days, two huh. days, because of this new development called the Da Vinci Robot, where they... All they do is put little holes in you, and they put these instruments in there. And the and the uh, the the surgeon is he takes these little dials, and he's got a camera in there, and he's manipulating these instruments. Took took my cancerous had a growth on my kidney. The kidney itself wasn't cancerous, but it had a growth on it. They took it out, and wow. I'm, I was home in two days. Um, so on that side of things, you can't say things are worse. Things are way 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 better. Uh, now, on the moral side of things, yes, some things are worse. Uh, some of it, I think, is related to the fact that we hear more about it. Uh, we don't realize how, I mean, during, during Paul's day, I mean, Romans chapter one talks about homosexuality. They had all, mm -hmm. the, they had all the vices we have today. Uh, and again, so I'm back to applying the Bible to every area of life. Why, why was at one time abortion illegal? Why was one time polygamy illegal? homosexuality illegal because Christians were involved in passing laws to keep them illegal. Well, when mm -hmm. Christians got out of the, the social and political sphere, things fell apart. Well, what do you expect? So when Christians say, well, we shouldn't be involved in the world, the world's evil, Jesus is coming back soon, you can't impose your morality on other people, there's a separation between church and state, uh, uh, politics is dirty, you go on down the list with all these. We have to render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Mm -hmm. uh, it just goes on and on and on. We gave everything up. We had the universities, Harvard, Yale, and Princeton, and what is today, you know, uh, Columbia. Um, all of these Christians, the, we developed all this stuff. And Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and all of these other guys with Zuckerberg, we could have done all this. Yeah, We, we could have done it. Dell Computer... Uh, Apple, uh, cr Christians could have done this. They look the best scientists of the day. What made science science today was was because of Christians. Uh, but we we don't teach our kids this. We we just we just kind of we're the, it's crumbs from the table from mm. what secularists do. We're just as smart as they are. We just don't have the worldview in order to actually make advances in this area or get involved socially and politically to make the changes ethically. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Uh, Grandma Joe here says, Gary, how does a, any complete destruction of Damascus, parentheses, should it, ha should it happen and how it relates to any end times thoughts? Um, uh, this will take a long time to go through. I have, an, <laughs> I have an article, I wrote an article, an extensive article on this thing because it comes up periodically. Okay, uh, if, it's if, on your website? Probably it, parts of it may be, but if not, um, if the, the person who wrote this, send me an email at support at AmericanVision.org, support at AmericanVision.org, and ask for my Damascus article, and I will send it to you. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. All right. Um... And this was talked about a little bit. I think Rob came. Hey, Rob. Uh, let's see. This gentleman does not believe Matthew 24 applies to the end example now or future. That's Matthew 24 is the destruction so Matthew, of Jerusalem, yeah, right? Yeah. Matthew 24 
uh, Mark 13, Luke 21, they ref it refers to that generation. That's what this that's what this generation means. This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Yeah. How do you know what this generation means? It go back through Matthew's gospel. It, it's the Greek word genia. It first appears in Matthew chapter one, verse 17. It means people born and living at the same period of time. It does not mean mean race. Uh, there's a Greek word for race, and it's and it's genos. The Greek the Greek word here is genia. Mm -hmm. It means so. And then there's the near demonstrative. The near demonstrative says this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So you can't get away around it. Um, and then if you look at verse verse 33 of Matthew 24, and this is the audience relevance. When you see uh, the abomination of desolation, and you will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, um, and then they will deliver you up to tribulation. He's not talking about some future group of people. It's talking about the people who asked the question because Jesus in the previous chapter said, your house is being left to you desolate. And they said, well, what you mean the temple? This temple that's being rebuilt, it's going to be left to us desolate. And Jesus came out from the temple um, and was going away 24-1 uh, when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he answered and said to them, do you not see all these things? Mm -hmm. Truly I say to you, not one stone here shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? And what and what will be the sign of your, your coming? Uh, not a very good translation. And the end of the age, not the end of the world. The word here is aeon, and it's not the word cosmos. The King James Bible translates it as, as the world. I don't know why it did that. And then you get you go through here, and I've I've dealt with this in my book Wars and Rumors of Wars. I'm not going to rehearse all this again, but yeah. I want you to look at verse 33. Even so, you too. Who's the you here? It's not us. It's them. Even so, you too. Because remember, there was an audience who asked these questions. There's an audience there. Jesus isn't talking to the wind. He's talking to people who ask the questions. When you see all these things, recognize that it is near right at the door. What is near? The end of the age, the end of the old Mosaic age. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So simply yeah. put, Jesus is describing what is gonna take place to that generation, not a future generation. That's good. Uh, let's see, uh, there's quite a few more questions. Uh, let's see, Jeff has another question. Uh, can the parousia mean anything other than the physical return of Jesus? Good question. There are two there are two Greek words in Matthew 24 that are used. One is erkomai. Erkomai is means coming and going. Uh, and so, uh, I'll give you an example of this. And this is kind of rather interesting. If you look at Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Uh, I think that's right. And the Son of Man, and the, and the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming, erkomai, on the clouds of, of heaven with power and great glory. This is a direct quotation from uh, Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And if you go look at that passage, it's very clear there that Jesus, is, the Son of Man, is going up to the Ancient of Days. That's erkomai. But if you look at verse 27, you will see, so shall the coming, the parousia of the Son of Man be. And in verse 23, parousia is used again. And what parousia means is not coming, it means presence. Um, and Jesus is literally present with this judgment. He is involved in this judgment. So parousia means presence presence it doesn't mean coming and i have a i have a 110 page outline on matthew 24 and i list all of these lexicons and so forth and that that uh and language studies that deal with it and, and parousia is is it means presence uh and jesus can be present but not physically present to to 
to accomplish something. Mm. Uh, you read this in Daniel chapter one. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the one who's seen it, but God was but God was the one who delivered this into His hands. He, his presence was a reality there. The same thing you're finding in Matthew chapter 24. When Jesus comes in, in judgment against Israel, he is present in that judgment. Um, you go to um, Isaiah chapter 19, verse 1, and it talks about how, the, how God will, will come on a cloud and he, the, the idols will tremble at his presence. And wait a minute, did God actually come on a cloud and yeah. you know, get off the cloud and they, these idols saw him? No. Mm. Uh, so part of the problem is translation, translation issue. Could it be uh, like Putin invaded Ukraine? Like Putin didn't go in on a white horse with a sword, right? He's still up in Moscow, hold up and whatever, I'm sure, that's, right? But, that's, but that's Putin is invading Ukraine, right? Is that kind of the same concept? Yeah, I think, okay. yeah, very good. Uh, uh, Putin is invading Ukraine. Well, he's not there. Right, when physically. He, he, yeah. he sent his his soul, his army, and that's what Jesus does. Uh, in fact, if you look at Matthew, um, Matthew twenty three. Remember these parables. These Matthew twenty three. These parables. These. Um, well, this is chapter. This is twenty. I'm sorry, twenty one. Remember these parables. This says the verse forty four. Um, and he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but um, whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. And when the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they understood he was speaking about them, not mm. some future generation. And then there's this parable of the marriage feast, where Jesus, where the the master is inviting people to come into the, the, the to, to the feast, and they're not interested in coming. So there's a, a invitation to go out to someone else. But look at verse seven. But the king was enraged and sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. That's exactly what took place with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Jesus was behind this, but he used the instrument of the Roman armies in order to bring it to pass. Gotcha. Uh, let's, do you have time for one or two more? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you, thank you. Let's see, Al Gibbs here says, is the coming... Mentioned in Thessalonian letters referring to 70 AD or final futuristic coming. Specifically, which passages do you think refer to a futuristic coming of Christ? Well, the, the traditionally, the passage in First Thessalonians chapter four has has does refer to what people say is the second coming of Christ. But what's interesting about that passage, there is no physicality to it. It doesn't say that you know the, the he will come and and uh, everybody will see him and so forth and so on. Uh, now, it does say that in Revelation chapter 1, but it says even those who pierced him. So a lot of these are kind of ambiguous as to what event they are, they are uh, referring to. Um, dispensationalists use that passage in 1 Thessalonians 4 to describe the rapture, mm -hmm. which is not the same thing as the second, the second coming passage. Um, you know, Acts chapter 1 is often used as what we would call a second coming passage. Uh, but the 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 uh, Second Thessalonians two is often used as a second coming passage. I think that's very cl very clear, not referring to a second coming passage or second. I hate to use the word second coming because I think the the coming of Jesus in AD seventy, <clears throat> if the first coming is his incarnation, the the second second coming is in fact his coming in judgment. But Second Thessalonians two. The temple was still standing. The man of lawlessness takes his takes his seat in the temple. That temple was still standing. And then Paul, the Apostle Paul says, and you know what restrains him now. The, the, my, my view is very simple. All of these passages need to be evaluated in terms of this. The, the, many of these passages refer to events leading up to and including the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. Once that, once we come to the conclusion on that, then we need to look at those passages which don't have a timing element, near, shortly, quickly, this generation, and so forth, and see how those verses uh, are, you know, should be dealt with in terms of a consummating coming of Jesus, which is, a, to me, a, although that language is also used in, in um, 
uh, Hebrews chapter 9, 26, and I think Hebrews chapter 10, 25. Yeah, that's good. Uh, here's one last one. Um, what we'll do with this is our last question. Grandma Joe again asks, when we have so many solid doctrinal, quote, quote unquote, teachers that have diverse interpretation of the exact same scriptures, how do you each hold to being the correct interpretation, truly asked in love? Good. I mean, very good question. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, and and I, I try to be as loving as I can in dealing with people I disagree with. Um, I think I, you'll find job just to I, not not to toot your not to toot your horn, but I think you do a fine job of really displaying a, a solid biblical non-camp and and name calling and and whatever. Yeah. You, you don't do any of that. It's very no, it's very I, no, professional. It's, it's very good. It's, it's not right, and it's 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 fruitless. You're not going to gain anybody's anybody's attention. I, what I would like to see uh, is you. Know, I'd love to sit down with John MacArthur and, and you know, and, and talk about this. I have a very, we have a mutual friend mm. uh, who would be great to just sit down. Just the two of us, not recorded or anything like that, just to kind of just say, you know, because I've been critical of some of the things that John MacArthur has has, has done on, on, on eschatology. Uh, it's nothing personal. I remember, you know, Tim LaHaye, ran into Tim LaHaye at a, um, and I wrote a book in response to the whole Left Behind series called Left Behind Separating Fact from Fiction and ran into Tim LaHaye and at a, I think a Christian Booksellers Association meeting. He was being interviewed by a friend of mine and I went over to the booth too. And uh, he said, Gary, you know, you're, you're, a, you're actually a nice guy. And I said, Tim, why would you think otherwise? <laughs> uh, just because I'm critical of, a, of someone's position doesn't mean that I have animosity towards them personally. Yeah. Uh, but you know, the, you know, the person who sent, you know, sent that uh, question yeah, it is. It's a little disconcerting to see so many different interp interpretations. But I, I think what's ha what's beginning to happen, the position that I hold, which is an old, old position, this I haven't made this stuff up. It, yeah. it, 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 it's been around for a very long time. More and more people are considering it. Uh, and to get out of this morass of, of prophetic speculation, and once this once this is solved, once you get back to this particular way of looking at, at, at scripture, then there's less less disagreement elsewhere. And I think more and more people are open to reconsidering, you know, these prophetic passages. I mean, I did it. I, you know, I, I went through the transition to this particular position. I, I read I, I read a book when I was in seminary because remember, Hal Lindsey's Late Great Planet Earth came out in 1970. I became a Christian in 1973. It was mm. all the rage long before Left Behind. Late Great Planet Earth sold, I don't know, 20 some million copies. One book, 20 some million copies. It was it was it was uh, dubbed the most uh, uh, most popular book of uh, nonfiction book of the 1970s. It mm. even beat out the joy of sex. So that'll tell you what that was all about. And uh, but unfortunately, it really wasn't a book of nonfiction. It was a book of fiction. Uh, and that has that has come be, become a reality. Um, so but I, I started off, you know, in, in that position because it was the position. What did I know? Then yeah. I started reading the Bible and I just didn't have. Wait a minute. I'm reading. There's some standing here who will not taste death until they see the son of man coming in his kingdom. What does that mean? Or. Uh, the, you know, you will not finish going through the, the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. What? This generation will not pass away until all these things take place. I, I was stumped. I didn't know anything. And then I came across a little book. It's called Matthew 24. That was uh, written by Marcellus Kick. It was published in 1948. Kick was, I think, I don't know if he was the, the uh, uh, full editor of Christianity Today or assistant editor. So he had a very good reputation. And it was a verse by verse exposition of Matthew 24 verses one through, well, through the whole, the whole chapter. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it opened my eyes because all Marcellus kick did was compared scripture with scripture. And he threw in some of Josephus, who was the, who was the historian of that particular Jewish historian who had wrote, had written for the Romans. He had, um, uh, you were lots of comparisons between the two of them, and it completely changed my my views because that's what I was taught in my hermeneutics class: compare scripture with scripture, and that's what I do. Yeah, you listen to what I've said in this 
almost an hour and a half, all I've done is pointed you to scripture passages. Now I've done it. I don't have time to go through all the details of it, verse by verse by verse. I've already done that in my books, Last Day's Madness, Is Jesus Coming Soon, War, Wars or Rumors of Wars. I take a biblical approach, let the Bible speak for itself. On yeah. This. Amen. Well, that's good. No, I appreciate it. We've had a, we had a great audience here, lots of good questions and uh, some side chat dialogue, which has been good. Uh, I hope everyone found, it, found this helpful. Thank you again, once again, for your time. I know it's very valuable. So, um, yeah, Last Day's Madness, get that book if you've not. That's probably what you would recommend as far as kind of break somebody into this whole kind well, of like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head. I want to know more. If you're not a big reader, here's what I've done. If you're not a big reader, I wrote a book called Is Jesus Coming Soon? Okay. It's relatively short. It even has pictures in it. Uh, I go through Matthew 24 up through verse 34. Uh, I wrote one, I wrote one a little more extensive than that called Wars and Rumors of Wars, where I go through parts of Matthew 23 and then 20, Matthew 24. Okay. Then I wrote a more comprehensive book that goes through Matthew 24 and 25 in short, shorter order. Plus, I cover the rapture, Daniel 70 weeks, Second Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist, the Mark of the Beast. So that's a much more comprehensive book. And those are all available if you look right down here. It says the American Vision, Gary Damari, American Vision. Uh, you can find all of those at American Vision, and um, and there, there, there you go. Uh, and I have other stuff too. Obviously, this God and government. I do more than just eschatology, American yeah. Christian history, apologetics. Yeah. It's uh, just a whole bunch of stuff. Yeah, you've got a ton, ton of books. Well, again, I appreciate the time, Gary. Uh, thanks so much for everybody participating. And if you're watching this later, uh, go ahead and comment and maybe share a comment. If it didn't get answered, uh, we'll try and answer it some way or another. And if not, just get Gary's books because he's got a lot of great things. Yeah. Plus Ken Gentry, Gary North, a yeah. bunch of other guys. Look, here's what I tell Lots you. of good authors. After reading the book, a lot of people come to me, how about Gary, answer this, answer this, answer this. And I said, well, I write, all, I, I write books so I don't have to answer the same things over and over again. <laughs> oh, I don't want to buy your book. I don't want to buy your Okay, fine. Yeah. But read, read my books. If you have any questions after reading them, send a question at, uh, at support at AmericanVision.org. I do a podcast, three, three days a week, a podcast. I, in fact, I just did one today that will come out tomorrow on Gog and Magog and Russia, because someone asked, a, there was a, a, someone had asked a question about this. And so I'll, I'll often answer these questions in, in, in a podcast or direct direct you to something that I've already done. So. Wonderful. All right. No, it's, been, it's been great. Well, I appreciate it, Gary. Thank you so much for your All time. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.